Generating Business Referrals Without Asking with Stacy Brown Randall, Episode 25. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Profit with Law. And today, this is a bonus episode with a interview And I am super, super excited for you to hear the content of this interview. This interview was extremely enlightening to me, and you're going to get a lot out of it. Here's let me just give you the intro who this is, and let me tell you why you're going to love this this interview. So this is Stacy Brown Randall, author of Generating Business Referrals Without Asking, and Stacy is a contrarian on how to generate referrals. She believes that you should not ask for them to receive them, and she teaches a five-step process which will show you how. She's the author of Generating Business Referrals Without Asking, host of the Roadmap to Grow Your Business podcast, and a national speaker. Now, Stacy and I crossed paths a few years ago in a couple of mutual groups that we were in, and I've uh, basically been following her journey ever since. What's so exciting about this episode is that Many firm owners, especially if you're in the early stages of owning your firm, but it really is not size specific, um, either don't have the funds to spend on marketing or would like to avoid spending money on marketing. And the only form of free marketing that we know is word of mouth advertising, networking. The idea of having a referral sources, strategic referral sources that you're not asking for referrals, but they're bringing you referrals anyway. That doesn't really cost you anything uh, other than strategy and upkeep and having a system of place to do that is wild. And one of the things that I always look for when I'm working with a firm is to have a plan in place that's going to bring you consistency to your sales process. And the nice thing is, is that the way that she outlines her process, you definitely can position yourself in a way where you know consistently you're getting a certain amount of leads from your referral sources. She has some case studies that are really interesting. Specifically, uh, she's worked with some law firms who have had success with this. And, and I think that you're really going to enjoy it. I think you're really going to appreciate what she brings to the table. Uh, I invite you to check out her book. And then I also have, um, at the end of the show, she's going to mention a way that you can work with her, that she can help you with creating the strategy in your firm. And I have a special offer to go with that. So make sure that you stay tuned to the end of the episode uh, and and listen to what I have for you. Um, I'm really excited about it, and I hope that it will be able to help you. So without further ado, let me cue up that interview. Hello, Stacey. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And we are as well excited to have you here. Uh, so I met Stacy in person the end of 2016 at a marketing event. And uh, since then, our paths have crossed on social media multiple times. And we might be in similar groups. Uh, we, we are on similar paths as far as our business growth goes. And um, when I heard that Stacy had written a book and I saw that she wrote the book, um, I was extremely um, excited and impressed with what she was doing. And I figured that at some point we were going to have her here on the show. So today's that day and I'm really excited about it. So Stacy, tell us um, just briefly a little bit about yourself and, and your history of how you got to the point where you became this guru on <laughs> referrals. Oh, so you call me a guru and a master. I feel like I have a lot to live up to now, but yes, thank you. That's some very kind words. I appreciate that. 
You know, it's interesting, the fact that we're having this conversation today about referrals and specifically the way I teach it, which is a complete contrarian to the way 99% of all of everyone else that teaches referrals, I teach referrals without asking. And I know we'll dive into that because obviously that is the, the main point of my book. But you know, the fact that I'm actually here having this conversation with you about how do you generate referrals and how do you get them without asking is actually from sheer necessity. I started a business a number of years ago, right around the time the recession was starting, and I really wish I could blame that business failure on the recession, but that would be a lie, would not be the truth. Um, I had done some other things that had led to that business's demise, but I started it towards the end of 2007, and it would fail almost five years later in 2012. It would not make it to the five-year mark. And it was some really hard lessons that I learned through that business failure, which was an HR consulting firm with big name clients. So from the outside looking in, you would have assumed my consulting firm was doing well. I mean, like KPMG, BDO, Ally Bank, um, Coca-Cola Consolidated Bottling, like some just really big name clients. And that business would go on to fail because I hadn't figured out how to fill the pipeline. And I am sure most of your listeners, the attorneys sitting there thinking to themselves, you know, like they love being attorneys, right? I mean, that's their thing. They're really good being attorneys. They're really good being lawyers. But we also know that if we want our business to grow, we have to be able to bring in new clients. We have to be able to bring in new matters. And so from that perspective, I was looking at a business that failed going, what happened? And I was like, I didn't figure out how to fill the pipeline in a consistent ongoing way. And so when that business failed, I had to go get a job. I always knew that if I had a second opportunity to start another business, I was going to figure out how to make it better. And the one thing I told myself was, is you've got to figure out how to touch business development every day. <laughs> and if you know me at all, you also know that I'm the type of person who I will work hard, but I kind of have to enjoy what I'm doing. So I'm not going to cold call all day long. I'm not going to spend every night of the week networking. I, mean, I have three kids under the age of 11. So like, I'm not interested in spending all my time networking some of those old school business development tactics, they work, they completely work, they just take a ton of time or they don't work and they take a ton of time like cold calling. And so when I looked at starting my second business, which, which was back then a productivity and business coaching practice, I was like, okay, how am I gonna grow? How am I gonna make this happen? How am I gonna fill the pipeline, have new clients coming in so that when I look up from doing one client's work, I'm not like, oh no, there's no clients there and I have to go find them. I want the pipeline full of prospects ready to say yes to working with me. And I discovered referrals like everybody else. Like everyone talked about referrals. I looked back at my first business, Turns out my first business, not one referral. Actually, the only referral my first business that HR consulting firm would receive, I would receive it about two years after the business had failed. So it was nice that I had a good reputation, but it didn't really serve me well while I was running my business. So I settled in on referrals as the way I wanted to grow my business. And like everybody out there, I went looking for advice. I went looking for training. Okay, how do I get these referrals? And all the advice was that I had to ask. And that just didn't sit well with me. I think asking for a referral is like a cousin to a cold call. And I didn't want to do it. And so I started paying attention to why referrals happen. And then reverse engineered kind of like, well, why does a referral actually happen? And is there anything I can do to impact that in a way that I don't have to ask? for referrals. So I started applying it to my own business. And in my first year as a business and productivity coach, I generated over a hundred referrals. It was 112 referrals my first year. And every year since have been over a hundred referrals and started having great success and grew my coaching practice very quickly, very successfully. And my clients at that time who were small business owners and solopreneurs, they were attorneys, CPAs, um, they were interior designers, realtors, and they started asking me, how are you growing so fast? And I said, oh, I'm just following this process about generating referrals. And then they said, okay, teach me that. And so I started teaching that process back in 2014, for just you know, a few folks kind of teaching it back in 2014 and then um, launched my online program in 2015, did some live events in 15 and 16, and really just kind of honed that process and got it down to like this reverse engineered five-step process of now how I teach hundreds and hundreds of people who've been through the program and in six different countries, how to generate referrals without asking and to do it in a way that people want to do it. And I think that's the most important piece of it is that it's in a way that's going to um, be authentic and feel normal um, and still actually have results. So I did it from sheer necessity of not wanting to endure another business failure. And now it's funny that became my company and what I actually teach people to do now every day. 
Now, uh, that is a, a, an, an amazing story, and um, I'm going to have some follow-up questions from some of the things that you, that you shared in that story. Um, but what I find the most interesting is that your first business had no referrals, and then that's how you realize that referrals were so important. Like usually, you know, people say, yeah, my first business failed, but the one thing I had going was X, Y, Z, and that became the thing that they honed in on. Um, you had the total opposite. So that's just a very <laughs> interesting interesting sequence of, of events in your story. Uh, and kudos to you, Mama3. You know, I've, I've, everyone on, who listens to my show knows that I've got I've got five kids, and I know it it is extremely difficult <laughs> building a business and becoming really good at something when you're also taking care of all those kids. And because as much as people say they're 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 not that big a deal, um, they are. They, they take are... a lot of our time, <laughs> yes. and we have to figure out how to operate in a much smaller time window than people who don't have kids. So. Just, uh, just an amazing story. And, and well, you do. Uh, it's it, it's interesting about that too. Is when I started my very first business, unfortunately, the one that would go on to fail, um, I was actually four weeks pregnant and didn't know it with my first. Wow. Not the way you want to get started. If you can do it any other way, please, by all means, do it any other way. And then um, it was interesting. I, I guess Jacob was probably about uh, four. Mackenzie was probably two when I finally was like, okay, throw in the white flag of surrender, had to go get a job. Um, and it's interesting, though, because I found that I I just loved controlling my schedule, having two small children like that. I loved controlling my schedule, being an entrepreneur, and then going back to get a corporate job. I was like, oh, my gosh, like this is awful. Um, like just the daycare needs and the being late and like, will I make it there in time with traffic? I mean, it was just crazy. And then obviously starting my second business. And then a couple of years later, we would actually acquire our third. It's actually our nephew. We have custody of that we've been raising since he was seven. So he came along in 2015. Um, and it was interesting at that moment being an entrepreneur again, right back in my business with my coaching practice and now getting my growth by referrals program going, you know, being an a child that we took custody of. I mean, obviously you can imagine he has a backstory and he would have a lot of times where I get phone calls from the babysitter and she'd be like, um, he's melting down. I need help. And I was loving the fact that that moment I was an entrepreneur and so was my husband. So we could just be there and I didn't have to go to some boss and be like, look, I got to go. You know, I've, I've got a kid that's crying because he's still wondering why his mom, you know, doesn't want him. So it's, it was, I would say that being an entrepreneur is, has its own issues, but also it provides its own joy as well and its own freedom. Yeah. And, and the fact that you have somebody else's child in your household um, speaks volumes about your uh, who you are as a, you know, as a person and your character and, and your husband's. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I admire you even more right now. So <laughs> I, I didn't know that about your about the third child in the house. So well, uh, you would probably wouldn't admire us if you hear some of the yelling that happens in the Randall household. But yes, definitely. He's a, he well, is a sweetie and they're all they all get along great. So yeah, I'm a parent too. No judgment. Right. <laughs> the yelling yeah. happens even in public. So <laughs> public, private. Sometimes I'm sure it's happening in my sleep. Yep, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, before I get back on track, I also noticed that you are a podcast host as well. Tell us a little bit about your show. Well, who's who's it targeted at? What's the name of it? Yeah, perfect. Thank you for asking. It's called Roadmap to Grow Your Business. And it is targeted specifically for small business owners and solopreneurs that want a straightforward roadmap to how to grow their business. We spend a lot of time, of course, on the podcast talking about referrals and referrals without asking, but also on uh, creating sticky client experiences and then just other business growth tactics, some productivity stuff as well, kind of pull from my past um, in that regard. So it's been out. Um, we actually are Oh my gosh, at the time of this recording, um, we're hitting like the, the one year anniversary of the podcast. So I'm over 50 episodes out or heading into the 60s. Um, so it's great. I really, really enjoy it. And I really think that people, I think podcasting is such a wonderful thing. I was on a lot of shows long before I ever had my own. And I think it is an off awesome opportunity for people to connect with the person they're considering learning from. It's just being able to learn from them in that audio type of format. I'm um, in addition, of course, you know, reading blogs or seeing them on social media and stuff before they make any decisions to work with them. So the podcast is, um, it's out at new episode drops every Tuesday, roadmap to grow your business. And of course, um, the main topic being referrals, but it really is your audience. If they're looking to add another podcast in addition to yours, to their repertoire or to their feed, um, it would definitely fit them. For those that are in those smaller business firms, law firms, maybe solopreneurs starting their own firm or have a couple of partners. 
Okay, great. So I'm I'm actually going to go listen myself. I haven't listened to your show at all, so I'd love to to get a taste of it. So if, um, if it's good for me, I'm sure it's good for anybody who's listening to me okay. speak here. So let's jump right into this. Let me ask you this question. What is a referral? Okay, I am so thrilled you decided to start there because I always feel like we need to set the stage correctly so that people understand the rest of what we're about to talk about. So thank you for that being your first question. So here's the thing. I have found that in all of my years of being in business, we take different sales terms and we use them interchangeably and we're doing it incorrectly. So people will come up to me and they'll be like, hey, I got a word of mouth referral. Or they'll say like they got some type of referral and I'm like, e, that's actually not what a referral is. So people confuse word of mouth buzz, they confuse introductions, they call it referral marketing or they confuse warm leads. They confuse all those terms and they use them interchangeably as a referral and they're not. A referral is a very specific type of prospect that's going to show up to your business. And they're gonna have two things that all other leads, all other types of prospects will not have. Number one is, is they're going to have a personal connection. There will always be a source who is a human, which we would call the referral source. There will always be the referral source who knows a prospect that needs what you do and makes the connection between you and the prospect. There's always a connection made and it's always done by someone that the prospect trusts. And of course, the, that's being the referral source and the referral source trusts you to solve the prospect's problem. So there's number one is a personal connection. Number two is there's always a need identified. So that when the prospect's being connected to you by that referral source, they know they have a problem and they're actually in buying mode, buying mentality. When you look at why people talk about referrals as so amazing and they talk about they're easier to close and quicker to close and they're less price sensitive and they just move through the buyer's journey faster and they show up saying, let me hire you, I already trust you. When that is all happening, it's because you have a true referral which means they've been referred by someone they trust. So that trust is transferred to you. And that person, that prospect knows they have a problem. So they're already into solving it mentality. So they're willing to meet with you to talk about that problem. When we get word of mouth buzz, it's really someone's definitely talking about you, but they're not connecting you, right? So it's someone saying, hey, Tom, did you, were your ears ringing the other week? I was talking about you to a client who needs to hire you. But you don't know who that client is because there was no connection. A need was identified, but no connection. Or I'll see people who get introductions and they're like, well, I was connected to this person. I'm like, yeah, but you don't know if you're meeting them just to meet them for coffee to grow your network or if you're meeting them because they need to hire you. And so it's always having that need identified and it's always having that personal connection. And when you have those two pieces in place, then you have a true referral. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I receive a phone call from a client or a, an associate uh, of mine that says, oh, I just ran into somebody who desperately needs your services and I gave them your number and I never hear from that person. It's uh, the most frustrating thing, right? Yep, <laughs> You're like, it's yep. so close to a new client. And it's interesting, inside my program, Growth by Referrals, one of the things that I teach, um, and actually you don't even have to be in the program to get this. Um, this is just something you can grab from my website as well. Well, um, it's called the flip scripts. So it's um, how do you take something like that, a word of mouth buzz, and in that moment when you're on the phone, right, talking with your client who said, I've been talking about you, right, to somebody else, I teach language that allows you to flip that into an actual referral, whether it's an introduction, word of mouth buzz, or a warm lead, kind of just flipping it into a referral is really important. And so obviously I teach it inside my program, but it's also just a product that's available. It's a script, it's available on my website as well um, that anyone can purchase if they want. But it's really important, an arsenal of language that you need to have that really makes it so much easier when you're so close to receiving a referral to just go that extra little bit to turn them into a referral. It's just knowing some basic couple of sentences. So definitely if folks want to check that out, they certainly can. That's over on my website. Yeah. What's the URL to, for that? So you would go to stacybrownrandall.com. Stacy has an E. And then to go directly, you can find it from there. Um, or that's the work with me page to go directly to it. You'll go to stacybrownrandall.com forward slash work with me. Um, all one word, just work with me. And then just go down to the bottom. You'll see scripts. There's a first meeting script of the, what's the script you need to be using when you're meeting with a referred prospect, including two questions. 
you should be asking and asking nothing else to help that referral, that referred prospect close themselves. And then the flip scripts are there as well. And it'll take you right to it. And they're like less than a hundred dollars. So like these scripts are really um, affordable for anyone to grab because I think that information, having that in our arsenal is so, so important. Absolutely. And um, one thing that I noticed in, in your description of what a referral is, and just to recap, you, you need two things, right? Or, or three. Mm -hmm. You need the refer the referral source. You need somebody who has an immediate need, and then you need to be able to solve that need, right? So it seems to me like the most important piece of this entire puzzle is the referral source because anybody, we can identify somebody with a need in many different forms. As a matter of fact, we can just run Google ads to somebody who's searching for the solution that you provide. But what that referral source provides is that trust, uh, which is what makes referrals such a great, such a great source of leads for the business because they're already walking through the door knowing that they want to work with you because, you know, Johnny X has, you know, has talked about how amazing you are at what you do. Uh, that's really cool. And my question to you is, what are those referral sources specifically? What comes to mind to me right off the bat is clients. But I know that specifically with law firm owners, I get a lot of resistance from my clients saying that they're uncomfortable going to their clients to, to, you know, to ask for referrals. And I know that you're referrals without asking. So we'll have to cover how you do that without asking. But regardless, they, they, uh, they think that their clients are, you know, they're, they don't necessarily want people to know that they've used their services, depending on the practice area, or they just don't want it advertised that they use their services. So is there a solution to that piece? And also, are there other referral sources that attorneys should be looking at besides for their clients? That's such a great question. So yes, there are four types of referral sources and that you should be cultivating. Now, the truth is out of the four, I only teach to two of them because the other two are subjective and pretty hard to actually put a process around. And I believe that if you're going to start generating referrals without asking where I'm going to teach you how to do that, right? I, at the end of the day, for you to do it as a busy business owner, I need to put it into a process you can follow. So to do that, I can only put a process around two of those four. So let me give you the four and then we kind of go into them. Um, so the first one, of course, is exactly what you said. It's clients. Clients can absolutely be a great source of referrals. But to your point, right, if you're thinking about some of the attorneys that may be listening to this and the type of um, the law that they actually um, practice, it may not be possible. So like one of my best case studies is Amanda. She is a, um, an attorney on the civil side. She does a lot of personal injury and some other things as well. And so as you can imagine, right, it's, it's not so much that her clients wouldn't refer her, right, because she's a great personal injury attorney and when they are in the darkest days of their life of something terrible happening to them or a loved one, like obviously they would refer that all day long if she, because she took such great care of them, but she's not interested in reminding them all the time about the work that they had to do together because of what it represented in their life. So she doesn't look as clients as the opportunity to really bring in referrals. And I know I have a number of criminal folks who go through criminal attorneys that go through the program as well. Um, that are in the same kind of place. They're not looking to generate referrals from clients, but clients is one and it should not be overlooked unless your type of law has you kind of saying, mm, I'm not really quite sure that's going to work the way I want it to. Um, don't ever underestimate though when someone says, I have this problem that one of your clients won't say, hey, you know what? We've never talked about this, but I know exactly who you should call because he or she was amazing and helped me. So yes, your clients can be, but to your point, not everybody wants to focus on clients. So the other area I tell folks to focus on is centers of influence. So when I talk about Amanda, the, um, who does the um, personal injury law, she's one of my best case studies because she started out lo looking at it saying, okay, I'm not going to get referrals from clients, or if I do, it's going to be like sporadic and I don't want to focus on it. How do I get referrals from my centers of influence? So we, I, she had to start from scratch because she didn't really have any. She had one internal partner who was referring her and she was like, I get about six cases from him a year and that's not going to sustain me, particularly when he retires because he was in his seventies back then. And so and this is back in 2014. And so she started working and really paying attention to developing her referral sources, which there's a specific way I kind of teach that, but really developing referral sources that were centers of influence, that were people who did not do what she did, but understood what she did and would also then come across people who would need what she did. 
And so it would come across her ideal client. And so she really started cultivating relationships with her centers of influence. And that led in her like first couple of months on the program to go from six referrals in a year to 12. And then every year after that, she hit that goal of 24 to 25 referrals a year. And last year, 2018, her fifth year on the program, she actually brought in the most referrals ever at 40 in a year. Um, and that's not much different um, than Catherine Taylor, who's actually an attorney up in Maryland. And she brought in, you know, she started the program in 2017 and she was in the same kind of position. She was like, how am I going to generate referrals? And she could focus more on clients because of the work she does. She works with a lot of business owners. And so, and then she was like, you know, I definitely was bringing in like one referral a quarter before working um, through the program and understanding how this works. And then all of a sudden now she's like two years in and she is generating, I think she said last year she got 40 referrals and they're getting like three or four a month versus one a quarter. So there is a possibility to look at this. Will you get referrals from clients or will you get them from centers of influence and establishing a process for developing relationships with both to be able to generate referrals. But the other two types of referrals are friends and family. So I always tell folks, when you're looking at your referral sources, if you have friends and family, you get to decide if they need to be a part of a process and a program, so to speak, to be able to give you more referrals. If your mom's always going to refer you because that's your mom and she loves you, she probably doesn't need to be a part of the program. So we don't always put our friends, close friends and family, a part of the of our program. And then the fourth type of referral sources is actually strangers. It's people who know you because you have a really good reputation for being able to do a really good thing, right? but you don't know who they are. And it's impossible to put a process around strangers because they may know who you are. If you don't figure out who they are and can start developing a relationship with them, it's really hard to trigger more referrals. You're just gonna have to hope that your reputation continues um, and they will continue to maybe randomly send you referrals or they may have been a one hit wonder that's the only referral they'll ever send you. So I teach people to focus on clients and centers of influence. Sometimes we're a hybrid, we can get referrals from both clients and centers of influence, and some were one or the other, only clients, only centers of influence. But we focus on those two because friends and family and strangers, they're just a little bit more obtuse to kind of put a process around or when we're putting friends and family into a process, it feels weird. So that kind of gives us, um, within those four, they're definitely possible, but you can really hone in and generate more referrals without ever having to ask for them from your clients and your centers of influence. Okay, so good, so good. So, so far we've identified what a referral is and we've identified uh, what the possible referral sources are. And I think that, you know, as you said, we're, you know, we folk, we're going to focus on clients and centers of influence. As a matter of fact, I am a referral source without realizing it. So all the time, um, I have people who say I have this particular need. And if it's not something that is in my wheelhouse, um, I make that connection. And I do it with connecting the two and saying, hey, you know, so and so. Uh, I'll give you one example. So uh, we had a podcast guest here, Molly Hall, Molly McGrath. I'm not sure which last name she goes by, uh, <laughs> but she's from uh, what is Hiring and Empowering Solutions is her company, and they deal with helping you with your team building in the firm and specifically filling filling spots. So if you're hiring somebody they will not only help you find the person, so they're not just a placement agency, they will actually stay with you for 90 days and coach you through the process of bringing them on properly so that they're in in the firm for the long run. And I think it's just such a valuable service that they offer, and it's not something that I do specifically with my coaching clients. So all the time I have clients who are looking for somebody and um, over and over again, I'm making introductions to her and we just, I mean, she, it's a center of influence uh, connection. So that's a perfect example of, of one of those. But I think that uh, attorneys really have it. You have other professionals besides attorneys are a great center of influence for other attorneys. Yes. Um, and the way I teach my clients is to totally niche down what their offer is within their practice area. And when you do that, you expand your center of influence. So if you're today a, a attorney that does, um, let's say you do your criminal attorney, right? So you handle any criminal criminal cases. If you decide to only handle sexual assaults and nothing else, you are now you now become the go-to expert for sexual assault. So now anybody who comes to you with anything else, you have an opportunity to take that take that person 
and do a referral to somebody else who is also a criminal attorney and theoretically would be your competition. But they are now going to say, oh, you're the sexual assault attorney. And every time I get a sexual assault, it's going to be something that you're so much better at than me. I'm going to send that to you. So it kind of uh, you build that 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 ability to to refer back and forth to each other. And you're now getting the, the case that you you know, the specific exact type of case that you want. And then the other thing is looking at other professionals. So if you're a tax attorney, you should be looking at accountants as a great referral source for you. Um, and if you're, uh, you know, if you're an estate planning attorney, you should be looking at, uh, you know, wealth managers and, and things like that. People who are already um, handling the finances of somebody who might need an estate plan. So those are the kinds of things that you should look at to expand your center of influence and, and figure out who it is that uh, that you want to work with. Stacy, we know what a referral is. We know that we need referral sources, but at this point, when we when we identify a referral source, how do we get them to refer to us without asking them to do so? Such a wonderful question. I wonder why you're asking that, right? It's like the million dollar question. Exactly. So here, here's what I would say. So we need to back up for just a, a, a slight second and make sure people understand who their referral sources are. So I think, I think you brought up a great point about identifying who potential centers of influence could be. And I will tell you, uh, many, many people who go through the program will start out not having enough referral sources. I mean, that was Amanda. I'm not sure if that was Catherine's exact, the, just those two examples I've used. I'm not sure if that was Catherine's experience needing more referral sources, um, but it was definitely Amanda's. She didn't have any she had one referral source that was not enough. That was never going to give her what she needed. And so we had to back up and we had to identify who were ideal referral sources. And just like you said, identifying it. And there's just how you talked about it. It's exactly how I um, teach it. I teach a process to how we kind of turn them into referral sources as well. Um, because we don't just walk up to someone and be like, hey, we're going to be best buds. And now we're going to refer each other. That's not how it works. And we're not actually looking for, hey, I refer you, you refer me. That's not what this is about. Because there will, you will always receive referrals from people you can never refer business to, or they're not in business. So there's no business to refer to them. So when we think about this, we first have to identify who are our referral sources. So I know you mentioned the book, and I always tell folks, even though I do teach this inside my program, in chapter eight, I detail out exactly how to go through and identify who your referral sources are. I would be shocked if any of the attorneys that your listeners that are listening to this don't at least have some referral sources, people who've referred them, some clients, some matters in the past, some cases in the past. So the first thing is to identify who are your existing referral sources. And then identify, do you need more of them? Which most people say yes, but not everybody needs more of them. And so once you've identified your referral sources, which is really just a process of looking at, look back at your past clients and figure out where they came from. And those that came from a referral, right? You wanna capture who that referral source's name is. So it starts with knowing who are our referral sources or identifying, oh, I need some more referral sources and following a process to be able to cultivate people and use the right language and the right relationship cultivation to turn people into referral sources. Because your question centers around, okay, how do I get referrals from people that I don't have to ask them for it? We can't build anything if we don't know who we're building it for. So the really important first step is Get to go and, and identify who are your referral sources. And then the way I teach this is if you know who your referral sources are and they've referred you and they've referred you within the last year or two, they're pretty much active referral sources. So the process works a lot faster and we can move quicker in terms of what we're going to build. But ultimately what we're going to build is an ongoing, what I call referral experience. Now it sounds fancy. When I say experience, I want you to hear process. <laughs> it's just a referral experience is a planned approach. It's a series of touch points that you plan in advance, series of outreach, right? We call them touch points inside the program, but there's a series of outreach that we're going to do, touch points that we're going to do to our referral sources where we're going to be memorable and meaningful. We're going to have a lot of impact on how they feel about us because it's how we feel about them. And we're going to use the right language. So memorable and meaningful is not your newsletter, 
right? It is not you sending them a quick text message and saying, hey, how's life? Being memorable and meaningful, you got to go a little bit further. And it's going to allow you to stay top of mind because we're not interested in being keeping in touch. We want to be top of mind and we want to use the right language, planting referral seeds that allows us to kind of move into the subconsciousness of how they think about us. Because the truth is when we take care of someone, Right. Or think about it. When someone takes care of you, it builds goodwill and it builds this this feeling of, hey, I wonder what I can do to repay the favor. I wonder what I can do to take care of them. I really appreciate how they take care of me. The crazy thing is, this is what people overlook. And they, oh, I always get this response when people go through the program. They're like, oh, my gosh, this stuff is so normal and it's so easy. I'm like, yeah, because what you're going to do is take care of the people who take care of you. And you're just going to do it in a systemized way so you don't forget to do it but you're not doing something every month. You're not doing something every week. You're not trying to take all these people to lunch every day. Like it's just to be memorable and meaningful. And I teach a memory runway that kind of helps people understand like what we do has impact. So you can do less of it. The higher at the memory runway than you are at the bottom of it. If you can imagine email is at the bottom of your memory runway. Nobody remembers that you did it, but we're just going to take care of our referral sources. And then we're going to add in the secret sauce of the right language. So they think about us from a referral perspective. And that's truly what I teach inside my growth by referrals program. And it comes down to just as simple as that is it's all about taking care of the people who take care of you and acknowledging and thanking them for what they did. And then using this right kind of language that gets them thinking about you in that way. But you never ask. There's never like, hey, who do you know? who needs to be doing business with me. You're just taking care of people. And what's crazy, I know people say this all the time, they're like, it's really simple. It's gonna feel completely normal um, because you're gonna build it customized for who you are as a person, not based on what I would say, right? Everybody customizes their own for who they are is we're just taking it, making it all about our referral sources and we're making it to know that they know they don't go, um, they're not overlooked in our business and we appreciate what they do. And it's really simple things that we're going to end up doing. And I, I tell folks, you know, you're not trying to do something every month. You're not trying to send them a gift every month. Like we're not being weird. We're not being stalker, right? We're just taking care of the people who are taking care of you. And when you do that and you thank them, and then you use some referral seed language, they start thinking about you from a referral perspective. And it truly is amazing to watch it happen in people's businesses. And the the reason why it works is because nobody does it. Nobody takes the time to really invest in other people and the relationship side of other people. But hands down, referrals only come from relationships. They only come from people right, that trust you. They're only going to refer you if they trust you and you're referable. And so if you want those referrals that are going to come from relationships, you have to be in the business of maintaining those relationships. I just teach you a way to do it that's memorable and meaningful and keeps you top of mind and plants the right language so that we get the results we're ultimately looking for. So when you said um, doing something to take care of them, to be memorable and meaningful, um, I was thinking, you know, dropping them, a, uh, you know, a, some small gift every once in a while. Then you said not doing gifts or not doing something on a recurring basis. So can you give us just one example of what you mean by being memorable and meaningful? Totally. So, and I can give lots of examples. I think it helps people kind of visualize what this looks like. So gifts is definitely one thing you can do. It's just for the person who has no budget. I don't want them to hear me say, you've got to do gifts because you don't, you don't have to do gifts. Um, but you can, right? You, you can also take someone to coffee and have a conversation with them and focus only on them and ask them questions and get them really understanding that you care about them and then planting some specific language helps them think about referrals, but they don't even know that's what you're doing. But let me give you an example that is a gift because I think it's the easiest thing for people to visualize. So once you've identified who your referral sources are, you kind of get a sense of what they have in common. So when I did this in my productivity and business coaching practice, I coached small business owners and solopreneurs, but my niche was small business owners and solopreneurs that were also parents. So they were parents who were also business owners. That was my niche. And then I, I had some more specific niches from there too, mostly in professional services as well. But so that was my niche. And so when I looked at my referral sources, they happened to mirror who my clients were. That will not always be the case, just happened to be the case for me. And so once I identified who my referral sources were, I recognized, wow, 80% of them are actually parents. So I made the decision to, rep to recognize what I teach is called an off guard holiday. No one expects to hear from someone they refer to a business and productivity coach on Mother's Day and Father's Day. It's just not something you're going to expect. But I knew that 80% of my referral sources were moms and dads. 
And so I picked Mother's Day and Father's Day. Now, for those 20% that were not parents, I just did, you know, start a summer as my touch point and that moment and that time period because it kept everything from a process perspective, same time, right? Mother's Day is in May, Father's Day is in June, start of summer kicks off in June. It keeps everything together. And that's one of the ways I teach it from a workflow perspective and a process perspective. But for Mother's Day specifically, for this example, I sent all of my top referral sources that were obviously moms, I sent all of them a Wonder Woman water bottle for Mother's Day. Now, in this particular card, I didn't attempt to plant a seed because I really just wanted to impact how they felt, which the card just said, never forget you are a hero. Happy Mother's Day, Stacy. All that did to them was say, wow, Stacy gets me. Right. And it was a Wonder Woman water bottle. And when you remove that card, my logo wasn't on it. My name wasn't on it. Right. There was nothing on my website wasn't on it. It was a truly a gift for them, which means my logo and name cannot be on it. But it was a gift for them to say, hey, I see you. Right. I know you're running a business and you're also a parent and I get it. And that's hard. And you're a Wonder Woman. And I see that now for those wondering, I did not send um, Superman water bottles to the dads for Father's Day because my husband said no man would drink out of that <laughs> water bottle. Right. I don't know if he was not right. appreciate it. <laughs> I know. Right. It, was, it wouldn't be about them. So I did something different for the fathers. Um, but it was just a small little thing that I did that, I mean, People still talk about that. What they were still talking about that water bottle two years later. They were posting pictures about it on social media. If they had daughters, their daughters were, you know, taking the water bottles and using it for themselves, and they would post pictures with it. But that's not the point. I'm not interested in the social media presence that it may actually get. What I'm interested in is they we received it, and they felt a very specific way about me. Like while wow, Stacy cares. And this goes back to the human dynamic and the psychology of how relationships work and how referrals work. And it builds off of my Angelo's quote, which says, we don't always remember what people do or what they say, but we do remember how they make us feel. If I can impact how you feel about me and you know it's genuine and it's authentic, no fakers and no manipulators allowed, right? If it's genuine and authentic and I can impact how you feel about me, that is going to resonate in you. And then if I'm also planting some referral seeds, I'm also kind of targeting how you're going to be thinking about me. And that is ultimately what we're after. But it comes from a place of wanting to take care of them and wanting to say thank you to them. And they know when they get things, right, whether it is a card or I'm taking them to lunch or now most of my referral sources, you know, since I'm in six different countries, I'm not taking my referral sources to lunch anymore. They don't even live in my city, right? So I have to do things a little bit different. But the process works whether they're local or not local. It doesn't matter. But it's still investing in a relationship with them and figuring out what that looks like. And there's a process I teach behind it to kind of whittle this down so it doesn't seem so overwhelming because there are so many things we can do um, and to have the greatest impact. But that's ultimately what I'm after is impacting how they feel about me, knowing it's genuine and it's showing up in a way that like, wow, I just didn't expect that. That ultimately is what I'm after because that will impact how they feel about me. And if I can impact how someone feels about me, they remember me. And then I'm going to be the one person that they think about when the opportunity arises. And if I'm doing this correctly, these are people who are going to come across my ideal client to begin with, and I'm going to reap the benefits from that. But that's not the ultimate reason why I'm doing it, right? Obviously, I want their return on investment. I'm doing it because I actually do appreciate the fact that these referral sources drop new clients into my lap and make my life easier. All right, absolutely. And now I do have a question, though, and that is that you keep saying that you send this to your top referrals, your top referrers, and, and so on. Uh, when somebody's first starting out, how do they, I guess th these, the people that they're sending it to besides for the, the people who have already referred in the past, but now they've determined that there's, there's new people that they should become referral sources. Um, how do you get that started and going? And is it a different process or do you just put them in the same bucket and just start, um, you know, treating them with, with the same, whatever the, the, the processes that you put in place? This is such a good question. So it's a little bit different. So the truth is, is some, the reason why I tell folks to identify who their referral sources are, it's because once we know someone's referred you in the past, I get to use very specific language reminding them of that. And that's how I'm going to plant referral seeds. The easiest, most direct referral seed I can plant is what I call a thank by name. When I thank you exactly for who you referred to me. Right. So I say, thank you for referring, you know, Sally Smith to me. And it's the use of her name 
with the re who they referred and the word referral that makes a direct referral seed. There's indirect, there's direct, but there's different types that we can plant. We don't want to overdo it. But that's why I say you need to know who your referral sources are. Because to your question is, but what if I want someone to refer me and they're not yet referring me? Well, you can't thank them and plant a referral seed if they haven't referred you yet. So you have to kind of go down a different path. And it's this process that I teach um, called um, running five, keeping warm, where you've identified Right, You've, and I have some. I have some podcast episodes on this, and an article on this as well, and then a master class anybody can go through if they want to truly learn this keeping um, uh, running five keeping warm process. But it starts out by identifying who are your ideal referral sources, and then figuring out do you have a relationship with them, and that's a yes or a no question. And if you don't, you may need someone to be your champion, right, and kind of connect the two of you together. But if you do have a relationship with them or you're able to start a relationship with them, it really starts from scratch where you're building a relationship. And so a lot of times it does start with taking someone to coffee or to lunch and to having that conversation. But that's how we kind of initiate the conversation. Then we have to move them from that, from that list of people we're trying to meet to the list of people we have met, but we need to keep that relationship warm, which is why the second part of it's called keeping warm. And it's what are we going to do? What are the touch points? What is the connection, the outreach that we're going to do for those people while we're planting referral seeds and hoping that they're going to send us that, or that first referral, right? Working towards them sending us that first referral. Because once they do, they get dropped into the other plan because that's for referral sources. And you have to have referred to be dropped in that plan. I just need one referral to put you in that plan to start getting more but it does take more time. It does move a little bit slower and everybody you think should be referring you, you will not get right. You will do this process and you'll be like, well, that didn't work, right? And it does take time. Like when we talk about Amanda who went from one referral source to now dozens and dozens of referral sources, which is, and she's probably just under two dozen, I would say referral sources. That's why she's getting 40 referrals in a year and she can only take 12 cases. The truth is from that perspective, she had to cultivate relationships with people. There's work involved. This isn't an easy button. This isn't like go run a Facebook ad and maybe you'll have a client tomorrow. Maybe you'll have one in 90 days. Like this is a relationship you have to build. And so it starts with focusing on them. It starts with how can I help them? Because once you start helping someone else, they see you as somebody out, outside of just someone who's out for themselves, right? And so you start helping them. You start staying connected to them. Um, and there's a process that I teach of kind of what this looks like and how often you should be doing it. But it really comes down to st making sure that you are moving past keeping in touch and really trying to stay top of mind by focusing on them and using that referral seed language. And let me give you an example of that in just a second. Using that referral seed language to get them to a place where they give you their first referral. If there is a process. There are things that you need to do. But it comes down to focusing on them and helping them. So I would always say the easiest referral seed to plant is, so tell me, okay, I'm going to totally put you on the spot. So I hope you're okay with that. But yep, sure. when somebody says to you, Hey, how's business? What is your, without us having any kind of conversation, what is your typical response to that? Uh, business is great. Mm -hmm. It is most people's response. Yeah. Business is great. Business is awesome. Maybe for some people are being totally honest. They're like, Hey, it's not so great. Whatever. Right. Yep. But we, we, and it's, it's not, a flippant answer, but it kind of is, right? But it misses an opportunity. Like when if I'm sitting down with somebody that I want to refer me and we've gotten coffee or I've been lucky enough to run into them at a networking event or a bar association meeting or whatever it is and I have identified them as someone that I want to refer me. Now you can do this with people you haven't identified, but specifically with people you've identified and you're having a conversation with them and they look at you and they say, hey, how's business? Don't you dare say, oh, it's great. Oh, it's wonderful. Right. What I want you to say is I want you to plant a seed and if we're planting a seed and remember, if we don't nurture this thing, it's going to fall on the sidewalk and go nowhere, but we're just going to start out with planting a seed to see what happens. And we're just going to get the answer we're going to give is thanks so much for asking. Actually, business is great. I just brought on three new clients last week that were all referred to me by this other attorney that I know. Um, I really love helping, you know, those people when they've been referred to me because I know they already trust me. Don't you agree, right? That when someone's referred to you, it makes the process so much easier. Like it's a conversation about referrals, not telling them, Hey, give me some, not saying, Hey, I'm going to give you some. It's none of that. It's like, Hey, yeah, I just brought on three new clients last week by referral. It's awesome, right? You're planting the seed. Right now, I gave you an expanded version of how that conversation could go because if you're talking to another attorney, this is a business conversation you two should be having about right. isn't it better, right? When they're referred to us, they close so much faster. They don't, you know, negotiate our fees as much. They're like, how can I sign that letter of intent, right? The letter of right. agreement. 
And so that's the conversation that you should be having with someone that you've identified as a referral source. But that's a seed you planted one time at a networking event or over coffee. You've got to have a process to follow up while you're working them towards the place where you become top of mind for them and they actually refer you that first referral. Then we drop them in the process for our referral sources. But again, if you can take somebody who's not referring you and turn them into a referral source and then you get one or two referrals from them a year and then you compound that with like 10 of those people who are now sending you one or two referrals a year, that's 20, right? It's somewhere between 10 and 20. If you have 10 people doing it and they're giving you between one and two a year, you're going to get between 10 and 20 referrals a year from now you weren't receiving now. And depending on how much volume you need for the business you're in, the type of law you do, for some of you, that's more than you can handle. But this is how we build sustainability and true freedom in our business by knowing we cultivate relationships with people who send us business. So we're not so much freaking out about, you know, am I getting everything I need from my website, right? Am I getting everything that I need from that networking event? And do I have to go to that 15th Bar Association networking event tonight? You get choices. When you have a business who's bringing in referrals, you get choices of how you're going to spend your time and how you're going to spend your money. And that is a beautiful thing. And that is what I want for more people. Wow. You make it sound so easy. Uh, <laughs> even though you very specifically said it's not an easy button. Um, right. is, there's work. It's easy work, but it's still work. Absolutely. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of questions that, that remain and, and will remain with our listeners because we're just not going to have enough time to cover it all. But it sounds like there's there's a lot of work after that first conversation to keep that person in your to keep for them to keep you top of mind. Right. So what is the cadence of touch points? I, I'm not even going to go into the details of what those touch points need to be. But what's the cadence of the those touch points? You know, is it once a month? Is it is it twice a year? Is it you know? How do you then keep that seed from falling on the sidewalk and instead nurture it into a, a relationship that's going to bear fruit? So I always tell folks we're, we're aiming for when we talk about top of mind and what I teach is is that we're aiming about four to eight in a year, but it really depends on what you do, right? I remember I talked about um, I teach everything based on memory runway. So the things you do at the bottom of the of the runway, like email, you got to do way more of that to have any type of. First of all, you're not going to be memorable and meaningful with email. You're just not. I'm sorry. Um, you can't. You can only send so many jib jab animated <laughs> cards, right? That's actually going to be some level of memorable or meaningful. Um, so it really depends on what you do. And it really depends on like, every day, every person who goes through my program or that I work with one-on-one -on -one as a VIP and help them build their plan. It looks a little different, but almost everybody falls between the parameters of four to eight touch points a year. Um, and what that looks like though, and if you can be more on the four to five or six side, or you need to be more on the seven or eight side, just depends on kind of what your situation looks like and who you are and what you want to do and what you're going to do. Um, but it is not every month. We are not sending cards to people that we don't sign that a third party sends on our behalf every month that picks a random holiday and just says, hey, happy whatever day. That's not what this looks like. Um, this is actually, but this is truly a way to build relationships with people who can refer you and you don't need to be stalker mode doing something every month. There's some, there, I know there's people out there who talk about like 22, 24 touches a year. I'm like, no. No, 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 no. And you also can't be a one hit wonder or a one and done and think doing one or two things a year is going to have the same impact. Yeah, absolutely. I could definitely see that the one hit wonder is not effective. I can also see that email is not effective. It's good to know that that four to eight number is there because it makes it less overwhelming. It, you know, like once a quarter uh, or twice a quarter, we got to do something to uh, reach out or become memorable for that person. I guess the thing that could be challenging is if you want it, each one to be unique, you now need four to eight ideas, but you can use the same idea from person to person. So uh, you can, and that's, and that's one thing that I teach in that program is, is I, I don't expect anyone to be creative and come up with the, what these look like. Like we have student samples where they can see what other students have done. We give uh, a lot of ideas. We talk about in the program, the four must haves you have to have, and then some nice to haves if you can afford it. So we break it down so you can kind of see what this looks like. Um, but you can do this on a shoestring budget, or you can do this if you actually have a budget, but ultimately whether, where they're, wherever it falls between four and eight touch points in a year. Um, it really depends on who you are and what you want to do and that you're comfortable doing, but it really comes down to what do your referral sources need? So you may want to take everyone to play golf, but not everybody's going to play golf. So it's not what they need. So it's looking at it from that perspective of what we can do. And the best thing is 
there's a whole lesson inside the program about how you get somebody else to do this stuff for you by outsourcing it or delegating it to someone else, um, which is really important. There's some pieces you cannot delegate. Um, you can't delegate going to coffee with someone else. You can't delegate writing your own thank you note, but there's definitely things to delegate where other people can do things. Um, when I talked about those water bottles, those Wonder Woman water bottles, I didn't mail them. Somebody else did that for me. I came up with the idea, right? But somebody else did them for me. So there's also ways to make this easier too while we're just, you know, your listeners are running around being really awesome attorneys. You can have some help in this process too. There's just pieces they have to do themselves. Absolutely. And I think that the, the biggest key of it all is to have a process, to have a system in place to make sure that you're doing this this on schedule when it should be happening and not just when you wake up and realize, oh, my goodness, we, we're, we're short on clients. We need new clients. Let's hit our referral sources. Uh, so. <laughs> Let's hit them up because no one, no one responds like that. A true referral doesn't happen that way. Right. A true referral happens because they know someone who has a need. They didn't go looking for somebody who has a need. That's when we get to make it inauthentic. And it's interesting. I was talking with a criminal attorney who's in my program. His name's Tony. And um, he was sending out these cookies. And I was like, you know, cookies expire. So let's get them out. And he didn't send them. All right. He had his team of people, his paralegal or his assistant, office manager sent it for him. I was like, but, you know, these things have to happen on a pretty regular basis so that we can keep the experience going and impacting how that person feels. So, yeah, most definitely. Definitely, you can definitely get some help, but you've got to be consistent. Yeah. Speaking of cookies, I was working with a vendor who told me that they were sending me uh, a thing of muffins, but it never came. <gasps> you know, so that's oh, another that's thing bad. is don't, don't tell somebody don't tell. <laughs> that yeah. you're sending them something and then it never shows up. That's not good <laughs> either. That's not. Yeah, that is not good. So uh, when it comes to your referral source being your clients, Right. You have there's there's what I feel like conflicting things here where on the one hand, you only need 10 or 20 referral sources and you have to nurture the relationships. But on the other hand, your client list may be quite long and they all are potential referral sources. So how do you deal with using your client list as referral sources? Do you just pick a piece of it or do you or do you do? do something that's maybe more scalable with them to try to remain memorable, but also uh, keep have them keep you top of mind. Because you, you do the service at, as a law firm, usually you do the service for them once and they're done. Like um, there are some uh, practice areas that have repeat customers, but most of them, uh, you know, personal injury, estate planning, uh, um, criminal hopefully <laughs> is only <laughs> once you know but so you most of your your clients are coming to you once and then when it's one and done a year later they're, they're not thinking about you at all you know so what what do you what do you do about clients as a referral source in this case so you the question that you ask i'm going to answer it kind of with a two-part answer and the first thing is is that you mentioned that you know you have this long list of clients and they all could be potential referral sources actually they can't the truth is, is everyone has the ability to refer, but a lot of people don't, they don't trigger them. They don't trigger in a way to refer. They don't, they're not built that way. They don't think that way. And so I always tell folks hone in on the 30% you think will refer you and will you get it right? Nope. But you can at least narrow it down and look, let's just say you had a hundred clients. Well, let's go through and look at the 30% that we think could refer us. Right. And when I do this with my VIP clients one-on-one, -on -one, we were actually literally looking at the list and I'm saying like, and I give them some things to consider as they're going through and like, is this person well connected? Did this person like working with you? Let's start there, right? And then let's talk about are they well connected? Do you want them to be able to send you more people? And it, of course, again, that depends on the type of um, legal work that you do. But the idea there is, is like, yes, all your clients can refer you. They won't. So don't worry about it. We're not trying to get every client sends a referral. What we're trying to get is that 30% of our, of our clients that can become referral sources and cultivate them into referral sources. But to get yourself to a place where your clients are going to refer you, you're going to have to make sure that you actually are referable, which means that you have a solid client experience that not only focuses on the excellent work you do, but also focuses on building relationships. And just to the point where they know they're not a number, right? Uh, for all your clients, they're not some number that they're a person and that they matter to you. And so I teach this as two separate things. Your referral experience, you're building for referral sources, client centers of influence, whoever's referring you. A client experience, everyone, you deliver it for all your clients. It may look, the work may look different depending on what you're doing, right? 
but the idea here is, is that you have the work touch points and you also have the relationship touch points. And so make sure you first have what I call and what I teach called a sticky client experience in place that allows you to be referable. And then don't worry about turning all your clients into referral sources. Aim for the 20 to 30% to start that you think should be referring you. And then of course, follow the process to be able to turn them into referral sources. So good. So I, I, I would not have thought about doing it that way. So um, very interesting. Uh, and all of this stuff is, is really interesting because we all know that we, we get referrals. We, and as a matter of fact, most law firm owners, when they grow their solo practice, are that's their main marketing effort, except that they don't have a system and process around it. And they're just hoping that those referrals are going to come. And that's why they have these peaks and valleys. And that's why particularly the people who want to grow beyond solo uh, struggle with it because they don't have, they, they don't know that they're going to have those leads coming in. And because it's unpredictable, they're afraid to hire the, the staff that they need because they're afraid they're going to not be able to pay them. Uh, it's one of the things that I specifically teach my clients and, and, and speak publicly about is having a process in place that's going to, that you know is going to, is, has proven to bring in recurring sales on a recurring basis that you could predict. Now, that leads me to the final question I'm going to leave you with, and then and then we're going to go because it's uh, we're getting late into the into this interview. I teach my my clients to use a sales machine where we we find people who are actively looking for what you do. We provide them with a with an answer to their number one question. And then from there, we lead them on a journey that will hopefully result in them becoming a lead and, and, and ultimately a client. And that uses the uh, marketplace where you're paying for ads and you're, um, you know, it's based on your ad spend. You have the numbers, you have the data that you know what percentage of people are going to end up becoming clients. And therefore, you know exactly what you need to do in order to increase the number of clients or decrease by just adjusting what your ad spend is. So it's a very predictable machine. My question to you is, and it seems like this referral process that you have worked out is something that can be predictable. And, and my question is, is do you think that this is something that somebody can use as their primary uh, source of new business for their firm? Or is this something that they kind of use as an adjunct in addition to their other sales and marketing processes to kind of goose the, um, the, the returns that the firm is getting from the other paid processes? So it depends. Um, when you're starting out, you need other ways to be bringing in clients, whether that is through a Facebook ad spend, through your networking, um, through, you know, whatever other mechanisms that you publicity, PR ads, whatever you're doing, you probably need other mechanisms bringing in clients while you're building up your referral generating plan. And I always tell folks, give it a year to really start seeing those results. So when I talk about Catherine, who was, you know, going from one or two referrals in a quarter into now getting three or four a month, right, that was in her second year. So now this is Catherine and Amanda and Tony and some other people and think about Walter is an attorney out in Texas, like some of them that actually have this consistent um, referrals that are coming in, then you can determine once it's a consistent, reliable source of new clients into your firm, then you have to look at it from a volume perspective. If your referral sources are giving you as much volume as you can handle, then yes, you probably don't need, you know, to be really focusing on anything else. I don't ever think any company should have only one way of bringing in clients. I think you should always have a couple, but those couples should work and they should be the ones that give you the return on investment you're looking for. I mean, even in my business, obviously referrals is a huge way that I grow my business, but definitely, you know, I also do publicity and I also do speaking engagements, whether it's on a podcast like this or I'm on the stage somewhere. And so I think you should have more than one mechanism of how you bring in clients. I think that's just smart to have a little diversification when it comes to your lead gen and filling your pipeline. Um, but if your referral generation gets to a place where it is consistent, and here's the thing, you're going to track everything when you're doing referrals. Like that's one thing I teach. I teach a whole lesson in tracking mechanisms. So we know who's referring us and we know when they're not referring us and we know that we need more referral sources so we can keep this system going and we can keep it the way we want it to be. Um, so from that perspective, yes, it can definitely become a major part for you. But at the same time, you probably need more than just one way of bringing in clients, but it will take a little bit of time with referrals. So don't just dive all in and be like, I'm only referral based starting tomorrow when you have nothing in place to be that way. 
Yeah, and I think that it's really, really important to set your expectations right at the get go, because the reason that people give up on something is because they had the wrong expectations. And if you understand that this process is going to take you a minimum of a year to start seeing results, then you now need to set that clock and, and maybe even put it in your calendar because a year is a long time. Uh, it, you know, as we proceed through life, those years seem to be flying by. But when you're in the year, um, <laughs> that year takes a very long time to happen. And if you're doing these, these, if you're making these efforts and you're in touch with 20 people at eight touch points or whatever it is, um, it's going to seem like a lot for a very long time before you have the, the fruits of your labor to show for it. And uh, I think that, that that's really important is to just you know, figure out a way to indicate that, hey, I'm, I'm not done this race. I need to keep going, you know, and, and it's like it's like that. I mean, if you're going to run a, a mile and a half on a track, you know, you got to go around six times. So you, if you're on the second time around, you start getting tired. You're like, hey, I, I got to buck up and, and, and push through this because I got four more rounds to go. And but if you have no idea how much you got left, you're just going to quit, at, you know, on that at the second that that it gets difficult. So um, I think that's really important. Absolutely. Yep. And it's a process, right? It's a journey, um, but it's one you can definitely do. You just need to get started. Yeah. So Stacy, this has been amazing. And thank you so much for coming here and um, and just, you know, giving giving us everything you got um, and and really just being open and, and informative and communicative about every step of the process. And this is really something that's going to benefit the listeners of our podcast. And, and I hope that people, uh, first of all, get your book. But second of all, put this into action, right? So I, you know, I hope that they actually start to create a process and put it in place. For those of you that don't have a sales system in place, you know, understand that this is a year long process. So you need to still get that law firm, you know, client attainment machine going, whether you use my system or some other system, you need to have something that's going to bring you the immediate leads. You want to be in business a year from now in order to take advantage of those leads that are going to start coming in from the referral efforts that you've made. So it's kind of like you need to be doing this simultaneously with whatever else um, needs to happen to continue to bring in leads into your, uh, into your firm uh, predictably. predictably. Uh, Stacy, before you go, please share with us how we can stay in touch with you. If our listeners want to work with you, you mentioned your course a couple of times. Uh, if they want to be notified the next time that you have that course available or if it's available immediately, how they can get it. If they want to work with you as a VIP, how would they do that? Just share, share some information with us. And folks, any links that are required are going to be in the show notes um, of this episode. Uh, and when I record this interview, I don't know what the show number is going to be. So we'll share that in the outro that I record afterwards or the intro that I record after this interview. Yep. So perfect. So my home base is stacybrownrandall.com and Stacy has an E. Um, two things I always tell folks, definitely you can purchase my book, Generating Business Referrals Without Asking. I, I teach this in a five-step process and those five steps are mapped out in that book. So it's a great place to start. There's actually a link inside the book for anybody who purchases the book where you can actually um, go and get some free additional resources just for being a, a purchaser or buyer of the book. So you can definitely start there. The second place I tell folks to start is I actually have this great nine question quiz on my website. Just go to stacybrownrandall.com forward slash quiz. It's the, called the referral ninja quiz. My goal is to get everybody to become a referral ninja master, but before you can become a master, you kind of need to know where you stand. So you take the quiz and it's going to give you one of three levels of how you are now at generating referrals without asking. You're either going to be a beginner in training or a master. Only 2% of the thousands of people who have taken the quiz land at the master level. So if you do, congrats. You probably won't, um, but you can take that quiz and figure out where you are, and then you can understand the roadmap to kind of moving yourself from a beginner or in training to the master level. And my program is called Growth by Referrals. You can find it at growthbyreferrals.com. And it is one of those programs that is available when you want to get in. There may be different bonuses offered. There may be different pricing offered, depending on when you want to come and check it out. But I would say, hey, start with the quiz, start with the book, kind of learn more about me and my philosophy. And then if you want to take the step to learn more about it, go over to growthbyreferrals.com. Awesome. So I encourage everybody to connect and listen to take a listen to Stacy's podcast. It might be something really valuable for you. The name of the podcast is Roadmap to Grow Your Business. And um, Stacy, I appreciate your time and sharing with us. And, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to 
connect with you again. That was great. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Now, what did I tell you? Wasn't that amazing? Absolutely, absolutely mind-blowing. I, probably the same as you, have always understood uh, the value of referrals, the concept of referrals. I certainly have not been doing a good job of identifying my referral sources and then coming up with a plan of keeping them in, keeping in touch with them in a way that they know I'm thinking about them. And I think that you're probably in the same boat. And I can think of every practice area, nobody's excluded, that could use a, a referral strategy in the firm. And this does not need to necessarily replace what you're doing on the marketing side. It does not need to change how you market the firm. It can be something that you add to it. And you could go and do it slowly by, by having a, um, you know, a small number of referral sources, or you can go for bold and, and really increase the number of referral sources that you have. So my wheels are spinning after having uh, done the interview with, with Stacy and not only that, but I got on the phone with her after and we chatted a bunch more. First of all, I purchased her program and I wanted to go through it myself. I wanted to learn what exactly she's teaching and how she's implementing this uh, with her students. And I want to I want to implement it in my business as well. So I went through her program and this is the the program is amazing. You know, she really lays it out for you and makes it really easy to understand and to implement and to do. Uh, now, when I was talking to her, I was thinking about how can I help you implement this in your firm? What can I do to to make this even easier for you? And I realized that whenever we come across a new a new idea, something new that we could do. And even if it's even if it doesn't cost you anything to implement, it just costs you time and energy. What ends up happening is is that other things might take priority and it falls by the wayside. We kind of shelve it and say, you know, maybe someday. And if your firm needs work in the business development department, if your firm needs work in bringing in sales, bringing in new leads, then you don't have the luxury of shelving it and saying, we'll get to this later. So what I thought would be great is if we can do some accountability and we can work with each other to get clear on what the plan is and then go ahead and implement it. So here's what I worked out. I have become an affiliate uh, for Stacy for her course, which means that if you buy her course through my link, I will get a commission on the sale. And for anybody who purchases through my link, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be hold, holding two group sessions. In the first session, we're going to work together to go through, you will have already gone through her program, and then we'll work together to actually write down and create your plan. We're going to cover who your referral sources are. We're going to cover what the plan is of how you're going to stay in touch with them and what are the things that you're going to do. And... How are you going to implement it so that you're not creating more work for yourself and, and make sure that it's getting done? And then the second call we'll have, and we'll do that a few weeks later after everybody has had a chance to do the things that they said that they were going to do and to implement this plan and make that first touch point with the referrals. So you're going to get two free sessions with me. It's in a group environment. Just to put this in perspective, um, my hourly rate right now for one-on-one -on -one time with me is $1,000 an hour. So this is going to be very valuable, That you know, the, the amount of time that we're going to spend together. And I'm going to help you help put your feet to the fire and make sure that you actually carry this out and go through with it. And what's crazy is, is that Stacy's program is is so immensely affordable for law firms. It's six ninety seven for the independent study where you just you purchase it and then you go through her material at some pre recorded video lessons and and it's very it's very consumable. It's easy to go through. And then she has a, a VIP level where you get more access to her and she does a, a direct four hour session with you to to get it done. Obviously if you purchase a VIP level, you may not need the bonus uh, calls that I'm doing, but you're welcome You're welcome to participate in them and join them. So whichever works for you, uh, at the minimum, 697 bucks to skip, the, skip reading the book, get the 
information straight from Stacy, the step-by-step process of how to implement this referral system. So if you're interested in, in registering through my link and taking advantage of the extra bonus that I'm including when you register through my link, then you definitely want to go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash referrals, profitwithlaw.com forward slash referrals, and check it out. Uh, regardless of what you do, the content here is here for you. You can re-listen to this episode. You also could pick up her book and go ahead and do it. Whether you buy the program or not, whether you you know whether you're in this uh, the group sessions that I'm going to do or not, it is irrelevant. All I want is for you to succeed. So go out there and put a system in place and start getting those referrals coming in. This could be the the simplest portion of your marketing if implemented properly so i'm really excited about it and i want to hear how you guys are doing i want to hear case studies about this so definitely reach out to me and let me know if you've had a chance to implement it and what your results are that link once again is profitwithlaw.com forward slash referrals profitwithlaw.com forward slash referrals i look forward to seeing you in the program Let's get some profit going in your law firm. Have a great day. Thank you for tuning into the Profit With Law podcast. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us as well as helping us reach more people with this valuable content. Please leave us a rating and review in your favorite podcast directory. Join us again next time when we are back with even more strategies to profit with law.